Thank you, Richard. Now, Professor Ahmad. Thank you so much for inviting me and I'm uh, really, uh, I'll try and uh, bring in some of the themes raised by uh, the panelists. Uh, I'm, I'm going to focus a little uh, more on the national, uh, uh, you know, uh, side of things and how media narratives uh, uh, generally uh, display and talk about uh, violence and its various manifestations. Uh, so, you know, I, I want to start with the last year, which has been an extraordinary year, uh, you know, after the uh, murder of George Floyd. Uh, and in the weeks that followed, mainstream outlets, uh, media outlets deflected uh, the blame for police violence away from militarized law enforcement, especially by using vague assertions and the passive voice in headlines. Uh, FAIR, um, a media watch, uh, watchdog group, uh, fixed a handful of such headlines uh, from New York Times, Washington Post, NPR, and more uh, by saying Floyd's death in custody and they said, well, that's a wrong headline. You need to be more direct and truthful by saying police killing of George Floyd. Or, or as does tear gas, pepper, uh, tear gas pepper balls used on Denver crowd uh, by saying uh, that they should be changed to police use tear gas, police perpetuate violence. Corporate media outlets have uh, journalists and writers capable of identifying agencies and the detail, especially considering only a few keystrokes repair these headlines to read as though they were journalism. It shows then that the mainstream media outlets default uh, to subtly exempting police from accountability. Uh, Fair.org, uh, the media watchdog group, also tackled many other headlines through the year uh, by pointing out the euphemisms of a police, uh, I quote, the police beating the shit out of people, unquote, NBC and CNN repeatedly described rubber-coated bullets, baton beatdowns, and tear gas as aggressive tactics. And many other outlets called fights between unarmed protests and armored police as clashes. So as protests per persisted uh, for weeks and months um, uh, last year, you know, more and more media coverage and media bias uh, became even more apparent on how, how this entire issue was being framed. So, for example, uh, right after the protests, uh, I, th I think a week later, the municipal governments uh, across the country started uh, enacting curfews to suppress protests. Uh, mainstream media framed this decision uh, made by wary governors acting in the public interest to lessen nightly violence. Uh, during these protests, you know, mainstream outlets like the Washington Post and NBC welcomed governors' decisions to instate curfews ignoring the pleas of grieving protesters entirely to foreground uh, government and police. Uh, the Times, for example, interviewed current and former police officers, including Bill Bratton, an architect of stop and frisk policy without offering much insight into the context of racial justice protests. And that is what uh, you know. earlier Professor Karim was mentioning about the underlying causes of structural violence and structural racism. And that, and that is where media fails because it, it, it fails to uh, sort of highlight the protesters' reason for occupying the streets, denying the necessity of anti-racist demonstrations to alter uh, an ingrained history of racial subjugation, but also ignores uh, outrageous barbarism. And now copious video evidence exists on social media of unprompted police violence, police brutalized people standing, arms raised or kneeling with tighter, with nightsticks, pepper spray and tear gas, and with disproportionate brutality. Uh, one Twitter user last year, I think Chad Loder, uh, compiled a massive thread of nearly 200 instances of police violence uh, right after uh, the murder of George Floyd. And uh, later in June of uh, last year, uh, police, um, for example, equipped uh, in, um, uh, somewhere, I, I, I forget the place, but, you know, uh, police uh, 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 with, with riot gear uh, beat and pepper sprayed a gathering of people attending uh, an outdoor violin concert honoring Elijah McLean. And uh, uh, the mainstream, uh, for last summer also, mainstream news uh, took its time sort of catching up to the reality of uh, what was going on, but again snapped in their commitment to both sidism on uh, last June when police and military under federal orders stormed protesters outside the White House with tear gas, uh, 
and Baytons to make way for uh, former President Trump's photo op by a church. Uh, the Salon compiled accounts of journalists from Washington Post, New York Times, CNN, and other corporate outlets adopting direct language and eschewing the passive voice to call out the brutal and authoritarian act. But you know, this, these, these instances are short-lived. Um, for example, at that uh, last year, we had uh, the direct sort of uh, applause by the former president to brutal police tactics and uh, uh, and many people in that administration were kind of encouraging that. Uh, so, for example, uh, and in that whole process, even the independent uh, reporters and, in, and independent media were suppressed. Uh, so, uh, attorney uh, Doucette and mathematician uh, Jason Miller created a Google Doc spreadsheet last year that listed thousands of entries uh, uh, where the media were being stopped or attacked, and the Freedom of Press Foundation counted more than 500 press freedom incidents uh, only in last year and, 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 and they, they keep on in, increasing. Uh, so, uh, you know, um, social media has tried to kind of uh, change that landscape uh, for, uh, uh, for reporting on uh, police violence as well as, uh, uh, you know, anti-racist um, protests, but um, uh, social media has also employed for fake news and for disinformation, and even by the police, you know. For, so, for example, in Chicago, uh, where uh, uh, you know reports were detailing how the police were savaging protesters, the department's and internet presence was displaying these kind of happy images uh, where police officers were walking side by side with protesters, and the White House, uh, you know, disseminated also similar propaganda, as they say now where uh, police uh, kindness and acts are shown and, and highlighted. But I think all of this uh, violence is again, uh, uh, I think uh, you, you mentioned uh, in your introduction, Ken, about the gun, gun violence and mass shootings. And I think they are, all of these are interlinked. I mean, as of today, there have been 299 mass shootings uh, in the US. And uh, the uptick has been going up. I mean, you know, some of the local uh, incidents that, that were being discussed earlier uh, fall into that category. And, uh, you know, in, in 2021, mainstream media did uh, st start uh, giving some attention to gun violence, but uh, unfortunately, they, uh, they often tiptoe around or simply fail to acknowledge the racism at play in shootings where people of color uh, are uh, more often than not targeted by white assailants. And, I, um, and this uh, pattern of seeking to blame shootings committed by white men on men mental illness continues. I mean, uh, despite a lot of uh, pushback from uh, independent outlets, from politicians, from uh, active uh, citizens. Uh, uh, so, uh, you, you know, the, the coverage is so lopsided and so uh, like uh, biased that often it uh, does not educate and inform the public about the real crisis uh, that gun shootings pose. And, uh, you know, the key difference between, but then of course, independent outlets uh, have been trying to uh, report, you know, outlets like uh, Truth Out, D Democracy Now, Common Dreams, The Nation, etc. They have been trying to report on the connections between increased rates of mass sh shooting and the overall American obsession with gun culture. So Salon, for example, quoted many political scientists um, uh, and, and had a title which says it all gun crazy, for too many Americans, guns are tied to masculinity, patriotism, and white power. But we also need to, and this is the last part, uh, I know I'm taking a little more time than allocated, uh, you know, we, we do have to uh, factor in how mass shootings, gun violence, and the overall incidence of violence is also linked uh, to misogyny and domestic violence among many attackers. So for example, Mother Jones, um, this um, uh, independent outlet did a study of 22 shooters and uh, their analysis showed, I mean, this was late 2019, I think, uh, their analysis showed that 86% of those mass shooters had a history of domestic abuse, 50% uh, specifically targeted women, and 32% had a, a, a history of stalking and harassment. And, uh, you know, these, uh, uh, these particular interlinkages uh, then play out, uh, you know, uh, domestic abuse, misogyny, uh, the, this obsession with uh, gun culture and the fact that, that mainstream media does, uh, or 
plays very, very uh, minimal role in educating the public uh, or informing them on, on what a threat it poses uh, to America. And I think the, the, the issue of white nationalists, white nationalist terrorists, whatever uh, threat has already been highlighted by the speakers. But I mean, you know, currently uh, that is what the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI and their testimonies have, have already highlighted. And, and if you were to dig deeper, you would find all these issues of both structural racism, uh, white uh, supremacist narratives, uh, ownership of guns, misogyny, kind of interlinked, and they keep on manifesting them in acts of random and brutal violence. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just I just wanted to quickly add, I think uh, the, the key issue, fundamental issue that uh, is relevant both at the national level as well as the, lo as the local, I mean, the Ithaca cases has to do uh, with police reform and, uh, you know, the various sort of uh, the, the call for police reform intensified last year, then we saw uh, some movement uh, forward and then, uh, you know, there's a move, there's a one step forward, there are two steps back. And, and that's something that, that needs to be really uh, reimagined. And, um, you know, even when you look at the media here, local media, uh, save a few outlets, you know, you would often see that the police sources are quoted. I mean, their view is taken as sacrosanct as the truth, quote unquote. And that is where, uh, uh, where the problem sort of occurs because a lot of uh, communities or individuals or uh, whose voice may not uh, um, get out or, or, or does not get, the, get to the readers or viewers. That is what needs uh, uh, to be highlighted by, uh, by a more uh, sort of responsible media uh, uh, reporting and narratives. Uh, but I think uh, the, the, I come from a country uh, which is still governed by a colonial police order I'm from Pakistan and in, across South Asia, mm -hmm. the 1861 colonial police order is in force. Mm -hmm. And it's been, what, 150 years now? And if you look mm -hmm. at the origins of the current policing system in the, in the US as well, it is very much reminiscent and a lot of work, a lot of uh, research and studies have shown that it is still designed against people, uh, you know, uh, people of color. It, it is to keep them pushed back, you know, mm -hmm. just threats, black and brown bodies, you know, somehow. And and yes, there's been tinkering and there have been local changes. But I think that until that is not reimagined and refashioned, uh, we will not be able to uh, wholly tackle uh, the issue of violence. Question has come through um, the chat. Um, <clears throat> And it's this, does trauma at the individual level contribute to occurrences of violence? If so, what types of trauma have been identified as highly contributing factors to societal and individual violence? No, I, I, I fully agree with Richard. I think, uh, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, lots uh, more and more evidence uh, points towards how the, the, the role of trauma in sort of uh, perpetuation of cyclical uh, uh, violence patterns. Uh, but uh, at the same time, what we, you know, I would say that uh, I, I would go a step further, you know, that uh, what do we have uh, to counter or address that in our communities? So in a, in a lot of uh, places, uh, both in the US and across the world, I mean, there are so few opportunities for communities and, and families uh, that have undergone uh, traumatic incidents, you know, and uh, it's basically a matter of uh, public um, policy and how far uh, local and national and intermediate states are committed to addressing this issue. I mean, the link is there. I mean, it's, it's uh, very much uh, established. I'll, I'll just stop here and let Dr. Kareem uh, way and who knows far better than me on this issue. 